you're watching on YouTube, I want to welcome you and thank you for taking the time. I want to say a special hello to somebody named Dave who told me he was going to be watching today. So, hi Dave, and to my friends in Illinois who watch each week. Also, anyone uh, else that's watching regularly, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach us through our website at waltonhillschurchofchrist.com. We're on Facebook, or you can call the office here at the church. We'd love to have you join us in person sometime as well. And I just wanted to throw that out there. So today I'm going to be continuing with the series on Old Testament in the New Testament. And next Sunday I'm going to take a little break and we're going to look at Thanksgiving and not the day that we celebrate, but the act that we take part in on that day. It's the concept of Thanksgiving. And while both the Old Testament and the New Testament are adamant that an attitude of thanksgiving is crucial in the life of a follower of God. There are no uses of the word translated over that actually quote the Old Testament. So that's why I said I'm taking a little break from the series. Enough about that, though. Let's get on with the message for today, which is titled simply, The Law. I understand that as New Testament Christians, we don't spend a lot of time talking about the Old Testament law. The point I'll be getting to today is that we should, and also why we should. 275 times, 51 times in the book of Romans alone, the word law is translated. And that's where we're going to be reading from again today, Paul's letter to the Christians at Rome. I'll be reading from the seventh chapter. And for those of you who aren't really maybe real familiar with this part of the Bible, there's going to be a lot of talk about the law. It's important for us to understand before we get into this that what Paul is writing about is not the civil law of the day. It's not the laws made by man or about the laws of society, but God's law. The law given specifically to and for God's people. He's referring to the 613 laws that Moses taught to the Hebrew people. These are the thou shalt nots of the Old Testament. Even for those who aren't followers of Jesus today, some of these are familiar. They're familiar with at least what are known as the top ten, right? And I've heard it referred to, the Ten Commandments, as the top ten once, and it caused me to go back and study a little bit, and it caused me to think about the fact that many people, Christians and non-Christians alike, have convinced themselves that as long as they're not breaking any of those laws, they're okay. We're doing all right. I haven't murdered anybody this week. So I must be doing okay. My studies convince me that violating any of the laws or commandments that God has set in place will, in the long run, be a violation of one of those top ten in some way, shape, or form. I'll mention again that the law Paul writes about in Romans is the law specific to the nation of Israel. To those who practice Judaism, those laws are still in place. To those who recognize Jesus as the Messiah and as the fulfillment of the Old Testament law, there is freedom from the law. Again, we have to be specific about that. That does not mean we are free to do anything we want. What that means is we are free to live as God wants us to live, and that our salvation does not depend on adherence to the law, but on acceptance of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's the freedom that we have from the law. As we make our way through this message, I'm going to be talking about what that freedom means to us, as well as what it meant to those who first received this letter, 
And the first thing I want to try to establish is an answer to the question, why the law? There are a number of reasons that God chose to establish this, wall, this law among his chosen people. And I believe the first was to set them apart, to show them as different from the world around them. Holy is the word. The second is obvious through what we read in other parts of the Bible and in our core text for today. It was to teach them God's concept of right and wrong. How can you know what's right if you don't know what's wrong? Anybody have a really good day lately? I had a really great day yesterday. Do you know how I know that? Because I've had some not so great days recently. But yesterday was a good day. But without bad times, how can we know what good times are? Without evil, how can we know what is good? Without wrong, how can we know what is right? I don't think I have to convince anyone that there's a difference between what's morally right and what's morally wrong according to Scripture. It's pretty clear to us because God wrote it down for us. We can go back and look at His Word. It's like parents with their children. While people don't always agree on what's right and wrong, most make some kind of an effort to teach some concept of the difference to their children. This is right and this is wrong. What happens when that isn't done, when that teaching isn't in place, is society gets to deal with the aftermath. We have to have a moral compass. We have to know right from wrong. And the point is that we can't know what's right until we know what's wrong. We need a point of reference. And God gave his people that point of reference through the law. In his letter to the Romans, Paul spends a lot of time focusing on the law, and so I feel like it's safe to say that the majority of the readers of this letter were Christian Jews. Jews who had come from living under the law to knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior. I'm going to be reading from the seventh chapter of Romans, and in that chapter alone, the word law is translated more than 20 times in the NIV Bible. What Paul writes about and what the Jewish Christians would find difficult to understand is what I mentioned earlier, how Jesus had set them free from the law. Again, that doesn't mean they were set free to live any way they wanted. It meant that their salvation, their eternity, no longer rests on adherence to the same law. So let's read from Romans 7 to get a better idea of what that means. The author Paul begins the letter by doing his best to explain that the law is no longer the governing authority in the lives of those reading this letter. He actually uses one of the many laws to help with this explanation in verses 1 and 2 of Romans chapter 7 where it says, Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. <clears throat> Excuse me. As we can imagine, the person reading that might react with the thought, but wait a minute, we're not dead. How can we be released from the law that binds us if we're still alive? And in anticipation of that response, Paul goes on to explain in verses 4 through 6, So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. To understand where Paul's going with this, we have to understand human nature. We have to understand what Paul means when he writes about the sinful passions arise, aroused by the law. How can the law cause sinful passions to be aroused in us? 
It's simple, really. Let's go back to dealing with children, because after all, that's what God is doing here, right? He's dealing with his children. That's what God does throughout Scripture. He deals with his children. Once children are old enough to maneuver around and get into things, what's the first thing they want to do? In my experience with my kids, the first thing they want to do is the thing you just told them not to do. And then we have dealing with teenagers to consider. I can tell you that when Annette and I started dating, to put it mildly, her parents were not in favor of the relationship. In fact, they told her she could no longer see me. What do you think that caused her to do? Uh, we were too young. Our families were too different. I was, she was raised in church. I was not. All of those things were given as reasons. And I'd like to think it was because I was such a great catch. But I have to admit that I think her motivation was rebellion against what she had been told she could not do. And I'll, I'm okay with that, just so everybody knows. The outcome was worth it. That's what Paul's getting, to it, getting at in this letter. He continues his explanation with what I've chosen as our key verse for today, the verse where we find the Old Testament in the New Testament. Romans 7.7 7 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I, had not, I would have not known what coveting really was if the law had not said, You shall not of it. At the end of that verse there, you're re if you're reading from the King James, I'm just all tongue-tied this morning, I apologize. If you're reading from the NIV Bible, there's that footnote indicator. And if you're reading from another translation, you still understand those last four words, you shall not covet, are from the Old Testament. I pointed out earlier in the message that even non-Christians know these words these Ten Commandments. They've read them so much they've fought to have them removed from certain places. But they know what they say. And that may be a first step. As a point of reference, those words are found first in Exodus chapter 20. And it's where we read of God giving the Ten Commandments to Moses to then give to the Israelites. But actually, on a side note, if you go back and you really read that Exodus 20 passage, you'll see that God spoke to all the people that day. And it says in Scripture that the people were so terrified by what they had experienced that they called on Moses to bring them the law so that they didn't have to interact directly with God. It even says we will die if we interact with God. That's just something you can go back and look at. I, pardon? Something to think about. I don't want to tell you what to think. I just want to tell you, give you something to think about. For our purpose today, though, Exodus 20, 17 says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And again, in Deuteronomy 5, Moses repeats the commandments to the people. And there, verse 21 says basically the same thing. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house or land, his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. One of the things that I find interesting about our Romans text is that Paul admits he wouldn't know it was wrong to covet his neighbor's stuff he wouldn't know it was wrong to desire to have what someone else has, has if not for the law. He needed the law to teach him that. Are we not much the same? Don't we really need somebody to tell us what's wrong or right? Isn't that why we go to Scripture? 
when we have an issue or a question? And also, are there not things in our lives that we do, sometimes without even thinking about it, and then we come to be convicted and convinced through some revelation of God's Word that what we're doing is wrong? We shouldn't be doing that. It may be something that we consider small, like desiring to have our neighbor's donkey, for example. I don't know if you've ever had that desire, but we would think that was a small thing, wouldn't it? And why, we might ask, is it so wrong to want what my neighbor has? I deserve it as much as he does or as much as she does. That's the other thing I find interesting about what Paul writes in Romans 7. Why did he choose to zoom in on that particular thou shalt not? Why choose coveting over all the other things God commanded in the law? Come on, it's even last on the list of the Ten Commandments. Many biblical scholars believe, and I agree with them, that Paul chose that commandment because he considered coveting to be what we might call a gateway sin. Meaning it's a sin that can tempt us to commit other sins. It would be up there with anger. I think most of you know where I'm going with this. The first is rather obvious, I'd suggest. If I covet my neighbor's spouse, what might I be willing to do to get my neighbor's spouse? You want a visual picture of what that looks like? David and Bathsheba. Will I be tempted to go as far as David did with Bathsheba? First committing adultery and then having Uriah permanently removed from the equation. After all, these were people just like us. David saw something he wanted, didn't belong to him, but he found a way to take it. What if I covet my neighbor's house? Will I be willing to abandon other things in my efforts to get that house? Will I work too much and worship too little? And if we're talking about actually wanting a piece of real estate that another person has, will I do things that will cause that person to give up that house? Will I be a bad neighbor? Use your imagination. If I covet someone's donkey or axe or any of their possessions, will I be tempted to lie, cheat, and steal to get what I covet? If I'm guilty of coveting, which of the other commandments might I be tempted to violate? I'll just stay with the ten here. Violating numbers one and two, I would argue, could happen very easily. Anything that we pursue with more passion and desire than we do God can easily become our God and our idol. Number three, maybe, maybe not. You shall shall not misuse the name of the Lord, your Lord, your God. As far as number four is concerned, you know, it's really easy for us to refer to being an alcoholic as being driven and ambitious. And I didn't mean alcoholic, I meant workaholic. Driven and ambitious. When what it really means is we're putting everything else aside try to get what we covet. And not all the time, but at what cost are we willing to do that? This is one of the things that I mentioned we can do without even thinking about it, but think about it, and this hits hard for me. When we look at keeping the Sabbath day holy, Anybody else have a problem remembering that God wants us to rest? 
What happens when you are so driven to achieve things and acquire things that you don't get any rest? Like I said, that hits pretty home, pretty close to home for me. Number five resonates with me as well because my stepfather who raised me taught me two things. Your word is your bond and don't take anything that doesn't belong to you. Those are the two things I remember from my childhood. When we covet, we could be tempted to lie and or steal and for me to do that would be dishonoring the man who helped raise me. Those things would also be a violation of number eight and could lead us to violate number nine. You shall not steal, you shall not get false testimony against your neighbor. Can you see how all of these things can come out of desire for things that aren't ours, that God has not given to us, that other people have, but that we want so desperately. Commandments 6 and 7, David and Bathsheba. All because David coveted another man's wife. I have to tell you that as I was preparing this and after examining this and looking at all of this, I don't think it's a coincidence that Paul chose to specifically mention, thou shalt not covet. And I don't think the fact that thou shalt not covet is the last of the Ten Commandments listed is in any way making it any less important than all the others. Jesus is recorded as saying in Matthew chapter 22, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets Hang on these two commandments. I want you to take and think about this for a second. Look at the first five of those commandments. I don't know if you can read them from where you're sitting, but I think you know what they are. In my humble opinion, that's what it looks like to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Those five things right there. Look at the second five commandments. That's how we love our neighbor as ourselves. That's how we treat people. And I'd suggest that the last one can also serve as a summary of the rest. One more thing to consider. The first act of coveting was in the garden. When Adam and Eve were tempted by and acted on their desire to, as the serpent put it, be like God. No good and evil. They had no desire outside God's desire for their life until that moment. And then that desire took over. And now, as in the garden, our desire to have something that God says we can't have leads to all kinds of problems. Desiring to have God, to have what God says we can have, though, leads to forgiveness of sin, salvation in Christ, and eternal life. That seems like a pretty easy decision to me, or at least you would think so. But if there's anyone listening who has the desire for those things that God says we can have, and has not yet acted on that desire, the time to do so is now. Because when we do so, when we are obedient to the gospel, the ability to fight the temptation to covet gets much stronger in us. God gives us the power to fight that. The time to do so is now because God invites you into a repaired relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. Forgive us our covetedness. We know that you have provided everything that we need. There is nothing that we need that you haven't given to us. I just pray that our desires will not be
be contrary to your desire for our lives. That we will not let the things of this world distract us from doing what you would have us to do. We know that the desire to have things can drive us to work too hard or to do things that we shouldn't do or to be dishonest or so many other things. But I just pray that through your Son and through your Holy Spirit we would have the ability to fight that temptation, to be content in what you have given us, and to let the world know that what you have given us is more than we deserve and more than enough for this life. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.